Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. Today I'm doing another installment of my Question the Narrative series. And since questioning the narrative really has to do with the idea that much of history has been changed, I was going to dress to address some ideas on faking history because that is really a question that a lot of people have asked. How could they possibly fake history? How is it that they would have pulled something like this off? And I think that's a really valid question. And it's something that I've been thinking about even more often as I've been taking my kids out and exploring, doing some hiking, going on a trail around our house, just passing some old ruins. And I've just been thinking about the fact that a lot of people don't even know anything about their own local history, let alone the the country's history or the world's history. So is it really that far-fetched of an idea that that history has been changed and that we possibly haven't noticed. We see it happening before our very eyes. So I'm just going to get some of the major culprits out of the way. I'm not going to focus too much on them today because I really wanted to focus more on how things have been done in more recent history. So first of all, the main culprit for hiding history, and it's well known for it, is the Smithsonian Institution. And I always have to say, every time that I look at the Smithsonian Institution, just the building itself, I find that, I don't know, I to me that looks like Tartarian architecture. Um, anyway, it's a beautiful building, but that does not mean that it is a beautiful institution integrity-wise. Now, another culprit for hiding history is the Vatican. There are There's a much speculation on what exactly is being hidden in those archives under the Vatican. And yes, it could have been very possible for things to have been changed and for them to be hidden from us that way. And, you know, we can even go so far into just mainstream academia. Mainstream academia is known for hiding things. Um, and one example that I have is the Mayan ruins, the, well, the supposed Mayan ruins that can be found in Georgia. Um, they were actually trying to keep archaeologists from studying the site. They were banning archaeologists, actually, were not even let them in because of what, what, very well might be Mayan ruins found in Georgia. So it isn't unprecedented that the academic community would also be somehow hiding history. So now that I have those three main culprits out of the way, I wanted to talk more about um, some that, that maybe some people have not possibly thought about. The question of eyewitnesses often comes up. How is it that they could be making such major changes to history and there would be no eyewitnesses to kind of sound the alarm that these things were happening? And I mentioned this in another video, and this is all just speculation, but as I mentioned before, all of my question the narrative videos are speculation. And I would say that much of what we are taught as fact when it comes to history is also speculation. But I speculated about these lunatic asylums. Now this one right here is actually from my own hometown. It was recently demolished and you will find that these lunatic asylums, for some reason, even if they have groups that are lobbying for them to stay put and maybe be treated as historical landmarks, a lot of them are demolished for some reason. But the question really is, why did they need to have such big, beautiful, glorious institutions for lunatic asylums in a time where most of these areas had very small populations. Did they really have that many insane people? Here's another one. I mean, look at that with the beautiful dome, um, the, the nice, uh, the columns, um, very, very extravagant on huge, vast tracts of land. And you can't help but wonder who were they housing in here? Why were there so many people? Here's another one, State Hospital from Athens, Ohio. Here's another one with the beautiful um, columns again. And you just have to ask yourself again, if you would actually go on, on a, a website that talks about these different lunatic asylums, you will find that at the time that they were built, yes, their populations were very small. So if they truly did build these buildings, which I'm, I'm very, I'm, I don't really know if they did. I'm very suspicious about that. But if they really did build these buildings, why did they need so much room? So my question is, could they possibly have been housing people in here 
people who did know the truth? And was this possibly an area to keep them from spilling the beans, maybe to get some re-education? I know I'm speculating here, but again, we see history being changed before our very eyes, and we see academia nowadays actually talking about re-educating people. So this is not a new concept. And here are just some other photos of some more lunatic asylums, you know, places that you have to wonder if they really did build these places. Why did they need areas this large? Now, that's the same one as this one. This one kind of just shows how big it actually is. And this one here shows a close-up of it. But these are glorious places. And to have them as lunatic asylums, where they obviously can house a lot of people in areas where, again, there were maybe only a couple thousand people living there at the time. And you have to ask, why? Could these possibly have been used again to house the people that were at risk of telling the truth? And, you know, a lot of people have brought this up in the comments, and I think that it is a valid question is, was that even the purpose of the Native American reservations? Is that why Native Americans were put on reservations? Or could that not, maybe not the whole reason, but could it, could it have been a large part of the reason that they were put on reservations? Because let's not forget that Native Americans had a very strong oral history. They were very good at remembering things and telling them on, telling them to their descendants. And that is how they passed on a lot of the wisdom that they had. So they would be, if you think about it, be very dangerous to someone who was trying to hide the narrative or to hide the truth and maybe to present a new narrative. So let's look at some of the conditions in these, in these reservations. Native Americans are the poorest ethnic group in the United States. Native Americans have the highest risk for health complications. Native Americans, especially women, are frequently victims of violence. Native students hold the highest national dropout rate. Quality of life on reservations is extremely poor. And I cannot help but think about the fact that um, gambling, I believe, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, gambling is allowed on Native American reservations, and that has actually caused a lot of alcoholism. It has really caused a lot of the problems that they are dealing with on these reservations. So if they only allow it in very few areas of the country otherwise, why was it allowed on, on reservations? Was it so that it would lower the quality of life and that it would start getting these people to stop talking, to start to stop passing on their oral traditions, to eventually lose their history? So then I was thinking about Native Americans and how strong they were at their oral history. I started thinking about how mentally lazy we are today. Um, we don't exercise our brain at all for the most part. Um, how many of us don't even have phone numbers memorized anymore? Because all we have to do is look in a smartphone. You know, you just have to look up your, your call log or see who your contacts are and you just press their name and you no longer have to rec or to memorize that phone number. I've even seen people, um, even unfortunately homeschooling parents advocating that their kids don't need to learn multiplication because kids always have phones with them and they can just pull out the calculator. We are not exercising our brains in such a way that our memories are terrible. So would it really be so hard for them to start hiding history from us. Do you honestly think that anybody would even notice? So this is a picture. I'm just going to start showing you just some pictures that I've been taking as I've been out walking around my area on a trail. And what you'll see here is a ruin. And I'm going to have some closer photos to that coming up. So right here. So as I was looking at this, I was very curious. At first, I thought that maybe this looked like a chimney. And as I asked around to people who, who had lived in this area, because I've only been living here maybe a little more than a year and a half, but I asked people if they knew what it was. And most people, well, actually no one that I asked in person knew what it was. In fact, one person actually said to me that the idea had never even crossed their mind to wonder what that is. And I couldn't imagine, it was just so, it was such a sad statement, but I think it's true of a lot of people. People will pass things like this and they will look at them and they'll think, oh, well, that would be neat to do some graffiti on, but do they actually stop and wonder 
what these things are. I did eventually find out what this ruin was. Um, I'm not sure if this is a part of it or not, but I took a picture of this. This is like at the bottom of a mountain. Um, and I found that very interesting. But anyway, I did find out what it was. And it turns out that it is part of an old railroad bridge. And the way that I found that out was I actually had to email the local historian. Because again, no one else knew what it was. And this railroad bridge wasn't taken down until the 1960s. So it is relatively recent that this was taken down. Yet I could not find anybody. Okay, I'm going to try to pick up where I left off because there was someone at the door. But anyway, I had to find out what this was just by contacting, by emailing the local historian. I could not find anyone who actually knew. And yes, I did verify that that's what this actually was because a lot of times we know you cannot believe the things that you are told. And I'm not saying that the historian would, would be deliberately deceitful. I'm just saying that the information that he was given sometimes might not have been correct. This, however, was. Now, this is across the river. I took a photo of this, too, and I think that it might have been part of the railroad bridge, too. But again, I did verify it. Just another one of those platforms or something at the bottom of the mountain. Again, I'm still not sure what it is. So here actually is what the railroad bridge looked like when it was still up. It was built, um, I believe, in the early 1900s, and then it was demolished in the 1960s. So as you can see, that's what these little things that I thought were chimneys, that, that was this. So yeah, I was able to verify that that's what this was. But again, the people who grew up in this area had no idea what those ruins were. And honestly, I don't think that they cared what they were. And that is really how we can easily get into the predicament of history being changed because people are so apathetic that they, they don't want to look into anything. If they're not told about things in school, they think that they're just not, you know, not worth learning about. And I think that that's something that we really need to learn to get over. We have been so used to being spoon fed information in our school years that we don't stop and actually look at the wonders around us. Like, for example, some of these rocks here on this mountain, they look charred. And I wonder, you know, what happened to them, especially this one here? What happened that these rocks here on this mountain could have looked so charred? Why are there so many crumbled rocks all over the entire mountain along this trail? So really, it's, it's something that we as a society, we need to learn to get over this. Here's another example. Um, this is also, it's visible from the trail and it's something that I've seen since, you know, I was little and my, my oldest son, he used to call this the mean old lady's house because the mean old lady is Mrs. Trunchbull from the movie Matilda. And he thought that this looked like her house. So he always called it the mean old lady's house, but I didn't grow up in this area. So I never really was sure what it was. So I started asking around because the very strange thing about this house, more strange than really the house to me was the fact that it was it's sitting on this big red hill in the middle of the mountains and it is a different color than all of the mountains it is a different shape it's just kind of sitting there and so I was just wondering could this be man-made and again I asked around and people from this area they didn't have a clue I guess they just assumed that it was just a mountain that had always been there but I, as I looked it up, I found out that it is actually likely what's called a spoil tip. A spoil tip, um, I'll just read it here. A spoil tip is a pile built of accumulated spoil, waste material removed during mining. These waste materials are typically composed of shale. And yes, I looked up the composition of that hill and discovered that they said that it is mainly made of red shale as well as smaller quantities of carboniferous sandstone and various other residues. Um, so yeah, these are basically man-made mountains. And people in the area, again, really had no clue or, or even any clue of the, and I also have to say that it mentions a mine and there is a mine right by this, this hill. It's a zinc mine. And I've read that that also could have added to the red of the mountain. But again, People from around here, people who grew up here completely take it for granted and never even cared to look into it. 
So here's another view of it, and this is just an article about it. But what I found the most interesting, and it, you know, it has a rich history. This house does. It has 14 rooms. It was built by an officer that was in the, the Civil War. But this is what really got me. This, this is a comment on it. My grandfather helped build that house. He said there is a tunnel under the house with a passage that leads outside at the bottom of the hill and the door is camouflaged to look like the rock of the hill. And normally you would think that that is outlandish. But I discovered in another video that I shared with you that my entire town has tunnels underneath it. And again, this is something that very likely most people who live around here have no idea about. And the reason that I'm boring you with so many tidbits about my own area is because I'm encouraging you to look around and see what you have around around you and what can you find out. And we need to just be in the predicament that it's impossible for them to fool us because we are so informed. That is at, that is at least a goal that we can have. And I think that it's not something that will, you know, actually happen for us to be for us to know that much stuff but we've got to stop being apathetic because if we stop being apathetic they can't just you know change history right underneath us and then none of us even notice so another thing that i found as i was researching um now i did another video on bed bug cave and how it was turned into a slate quarry and there's a lot of very ambiguous language when you read about bed bug cave and the quarry that was there and especially the tunnels um, a lot of times it will just tell you that the tunnels were purchased but it never actually tells you who built the tunnels i actually did email the same historian that told me about the railroad bridge and i asked him if he knew anything additional about about the bed bug cave or the quarry and he said he had no additional information on it so that's something else that you will find a lot in history you will see very ambiguous um wording especially when you see words like founded because it does make it sound like they actually found the town that it was already standing there and that's something else that you really do need to learn learn to look out for so anyway so i was talking about the tunnels and i found this here it says the tunnel quarry was arguably the most well known of the sources of sleet for the industry although formally renamed the mantle quarry later it was equipped with push cart tracks like those in an old coal mine and the tunnel stretched under the streets of of slatington and i have to say that i actually i believe that they cover um the entire length and some of the width of the town um, and then it's here, it says, I vaguely remember my grandmother telling me that a lot of the houses in town had doors in their basements by which they could access these tunnels. Yes, yes, doors in the basements that open up into the tunnels. And it says, which might have been how many of the slate workers went to and from their jobs every day. So that is extremely interesting information, at least to me. But again, I asked around to some of the neighbors and people who grew up here and they had no idea. They, they actually don't know what is right underneath them. Um, and also, as I was looking things up, it said that in the olden days, a lot of personal information was published as public knowledge, and it is quite amazing the extent of that information. There was often news of who was visiting whom. There were attendance reports from the schools, and there were, there were I think it should be there, and there were grade averages from the high school. Also, you would have thought that the paper would have paid closer attention to births, deaths, and weddings in the town, but that was not the case in the 1880s and 90s. There was more town information being published by 1920, and I find that to be very, very interesting if you think about the mud flood and the timeline for the mud flood and the fact that they were not apparently keeping track of births, deaths, and weddings in the town until the 1880s and 90s, and could it possibly have to do something with the mud flood i don't know but again these are all questions that we need to start asking um we need to stop just expecting people to hand the information to us because when we do that they likely will not give us the correct information now the last way that i just wanted to talk about how they could easily fool us is that i've had several times in the comments now this is the question the narrative series so i'm questioning the narrative and the things that they tell us but very often I will get people who basically will copy and paste something from Wikipedia or from like the, the History Channel website or from the Smithsonian website and they'll copy and paste it, put that in my in my comment and then just make, you know, make it sound like there you go. This is the truth. Now, now you know what the question is. And it's 
no, that's not the that's not the answer to the question. The whole idea of questioning the narrative means that I'm questioning those things. So and that's that's a problem. People believe exactly what they read and they don't think about it. Um, they don't think logistically about how things could have possibly happened. And it's something that we need to start to learn to be a little more discerning. Um, stop just believing things just because they're telling you that that's the truth. Especially, you know, if you're on a question the narrative video and then you're just actually copying and pasting the narrative, putting it in the comments and saying, there you go, I answered all the questions for you. When those were all the questions that I had to begin with because I don't believe what that originally says. So that's, you know, that's to me, that's like saying, me saying to someone, well, I don't believe that NASA went to the moon because they they have a history of being deceptive and I don't trust anything that NASA says. And then if someone says, oh, but look, here's an article written by NASA and this is proof that they went to the moon. And it's kind of along those lines. Um, you cannot, to me, at least to me, you cannot write off the questions that we have by just regurgitating the same things that we are bringing up as questionable to begin with. So anyway, that those are my ideas on how they might have faked history is, you know, just again, Smithsonian, Vatican, academia, and just our apathy. The fact that most people do not care what's going on around them and they don't notice anything anymore. Anyway, that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one down below or you can leave one over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.